you know something, Mike? I think it'll definitely happen. Uh, you know, as to when expansion will occur, uh, certainly I'm not prescient enough to know that. But uh, I think in a timely fashion that there will be an expansion, and I think I think Seattle will be at the head of the list. Welcome to another edition of Iconic Sonics. I'm your host, Mike Gastineau, and I'm really looking forward to today's show because we're going to cover, well, we'll cover a lot of things, but we're going to cover in particular an era of the Sonics that we've not talked about a lot, and that is the very beginning of the franchise in the late 60s. And we're going to do it uh, with a guy who is in the NBA Hall of Fame as a contributor. I don't think it's stretching it to say he devoted his life to professional basketball. Rod Thorne, it is great to see you, an original Sonic, uh, a legend within NBA circles and a Hall of Famer. Thanks for doing this, Rod, and welcome. Oh, it's my pleasure, Mike. Nice to be on with you. We're all proud of where we came from, and West Virginia is a primarily rural state and mountainous and mining and, and blue-collar workers. I'm assuming you take a tremendous amount of pride in the idea that there were many building blocks in the NBA, but three of the building blocks came from your state right at one after another. And I'm talking about Hot Rod Hundley, Jerry West, and then Rod Thorne. Three great players came out, impacted the league for years. You, know, you and your way, Jerry West played and has been an executive and has done everything. Hot Rod was a broadcaster, which is probably appropriately uh, appropriate for him. What about that? Three guys from little old West Virginia that impacted the league like that. Uh, you know, it, it uh, when you really think about it, uh, Mike, it's uh, it, it's it's re reasonably unique. Uh, Hot Rod came first, and Jerry was uh, Wes was a freshman when Hot Rod was a senior, and then I was a freshman when uh, Jerry was a senior, and we followed uh, each other. And we had another pretty daggone good player that came right after me, and uh, Ron Williams. Sure, he had a very uh, a very nice NBA career, but. But West Virginia during those times had some really top flight teams and a lot of uh, very good basketball players. Regular entry into the NCAA tournament during those years. Uh, I know you weren't allowed to play. The rules wouldn't let people play as a freshman. Did, were, you, were you able to practice with West though? Could you, could you guys all practice together? You know, our freshman team was probably better than the backup uh, players for the for the varsity so we huh. practiced a lot with them preseason. you know once the season started not so much right. but preseason we did so uh, I got to play uh, against Jerry a lot and he was such a fantastic player Mike uh, I don't think you know people today don't realize just how great he was he's got to be one of the three four five best uh, two guards ever it's funny because we always get into who's the greatest and right now with LeBron on the on the, the precipice of catching Kareem for the scoring lead. I mean, you compare games and you compare styles and eras and the great ones really could play in any era. Right. I mean, Jerry West could play today. Kareem could have played in the 50s. Or the, the greats could could thrive in any era. You know, Mike, I, I would agree with that. Uh, Oscar Robertson, Jerry West were the two top guards when when I came along and they certainly could play today, and particularly when you can't use your hands nearly as much today to guard people as you could back in those days. And uh, uh, the great, I, I would agree with you, Mike, I think the great players, by and large, uh, you know, some probably wouldn't be big enough, you know, to play today as they played, you know, during their heyday. But I think the vast majority would be top flight players today before we get to your your stay in seattle and it was an important five years the very the very birth of the franchise i, I want you to just to give us a little perspective uh, i i read uh i've read it several times tall tales terry pluto's great book about the early days of the nba <laughs> league was a little bit different back then talk about your rookie year your living accommodations with the baltimore bullets because it uh we didn't have to be worried about how Rod Thorne was going to handle his money because there just wasn't a whole hell of a lot of it at that point. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Mike, I was the second pick in the draft. And, you know, today that player would have a, a, a minimum of a two-year guarantee at around $4 million a year. Uh, the year I came out, I signed a one-year contract for $12,500 make the team. 
It wasn't <laughs> guaranteed. Uh, we travel coach. Uh, we, I, I can still remember those five, six o'clock flights, uh, <laughs> you know, the next day after you played, uh, I, I can recall playing a game in Cincinnati at one o'clock on Sunday when we played uh, Saturday night in Baltimore and we were warming up. I could not feel my legs, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you, you know, what we played four games in four nights, uh, what one time that year, four different cities, uh, uh, much different state and motels. Uh, if you could have told me then that the NBA would turn out to be what it is today, I would have said you're crazy. Uh, it, it, it's just an entirely, it, it's just an entirely different game and an entirely different league. And and wasn't your rookie year in Baltimore? Didn't you share an apartment with three teammates, thirty bucks each? For the rent and three beds was all so whoever got in last got the couch for the night right no that yeah that, that uh, when uh, we had uh, there were four of us to start out with and we drew straws <laughs> there was one bedroom with one bed there was another bedroom with two beds and then there was a couch i drew the bedroom with one nice. with, with one bed and the guy who drew the couch was a guy named Barney Cable, who was the tallest of the four of us. And he had to sleep on the couch. But during the year, we picked up a player named Larry Comley. He moved in with us. So our $30 a month rent went down to 20 <laughs> <laughs> You don't find too many NBA players uh, paying 20 bucks a month. They get a little more now. It's all different, obviously. But it's fun to think back. So, you, so you're in Baltimore, then you're in Detroit, you're in St. Louis, you're, you're, you're kicking around, you're having a decent career. I'm assuming you're having fun. You're playing yeah. with some great guys. And then all of a sudden, the, the league expands into Seattle and you get taken in the expansion draft. What was right. that like? Was there any like, oh, I don't want to go, uh, you know, this is going to be a bad team and it's way out west. I mean, what was your reaction when you heard you were drafted by Seattle? You know, Mike, uh, I was playing in St. Louis and I was – you know, in, in, a, in a rotation, I was a seventh or eighth guy on the team at that time. And I wanted to stay in St. Louis. We had a very good team led by Lenny Wilkins, uh, who, who then became a great, great player in Seattle. Uh, and I, I, did, I did not want to be put on the expansion list, number one. And secondly, if I were put on the list, I wanted to go to San Diego because I, you know, I see Seattle is way up at the, you know, the top of the country. I don't know anything about it. And it was like, oh boy, I hope I don't get picked by Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> and lo and behold, that's, that's lo where and you end up. Uh, I, I did, uh, since I knew I was going to talk to you today, I did two things. My friends at Simply Seattle, who are one of our sponsors, they've got all kinds of great Sonics gear. Over my shoulder, you can see the, the original Sonics logo. That might have been your practice T-shirt that I now own, uh, courtesy of, uh, of Simply Seattle with the Sonics and the lightning bolt under it. And I've got a hat here with the original uh, the, the, the rocket plane logo there, the supersonic uh, logo. <laughs> right. There you go. So it that lives was, that's on. That's it. <laughs> um you you join an expansion team you know you're going to take your lumps uh what was the first season like i, I you know you know nobody was drawn 15 20 000, or very few people were for an nba game then it was only on a special occasion right the sonics as i look back on i had several thousand for most of the games was the reaction pretty good to a brand new team and a brand new product you know it it, it was mike uh and, and we had uh you know walt hazard was our all-star uh, at that time. And he had played, uh, you know, UCLA in the pack uh, 10 at that time and, you know, was a name player. Uh, but, but Seattle was great. Uh, what a wonderful city to start out with. The fans were terrific. I think we won 23 games maybe, uh, that year, but we were competitive, you know, for the most part. And, uh, just, uh, you know, my, my wife and I, you know, came out, loved it. Uh, one of the nicest places I've ever lived. And I've lived in a lot of different places, hmm. but Seattle was great. You had, uh, there, there were a lot of people I want to ask you about who you were either teammates with or, or ran into, but you had two 
I don't know if characters is the right word. One of them definitely was a character running the franchise. The owner was Sam Schulman. And we'll get into him in a few minutes because he had an important role he played in the league with Spencer Haywood. But the other guy was the executive, the GM, the do-it-all guy, Dick Vertlieb, who is one of the great characters in Seattle sports history. I never knew Dick, but I've heard enough great stories about him, and I'm sure you've got some. What was what was this guy like? Uh, this, this, as I said, he did everything for the team. What was Dick Vertlieb like? Manic. <laughs> uh, he was constantly on the go. He was, you know, the glass is always half full with, uh, with Dick, uh, great personality. Uh, I, I can recall the one, the one story I remember about him, uh, we had an altercation one night with, uh, Baltimore, uh, Bob Ferry got in a, got in a fight with, uh, Walt Hazard and then, a lot of people, you know, got in a fight. And all of a sudden here is Dick Vertley running on the court. <laughs> and and, a, and a, a Gus Johnson, who's a Hall of Fame player, saw he didn't know who he was, saw him coming and knocked him down, <laughs> punched him and knocked him down. And I think that's probably the last time Dick ever ran on the court during an altercation. But but he was he was just what the team needed. You know, at that time, he was so up and out in the community all the time, you know, doing good things. And uh, it was a great guy to work for. I don't know if you remember this, but one of the stories that came out of that time was Vert Lieb. And again, he was he was a marketer. He understood where the NBA could go. And he had come. He had a little bit of a he'd been in L.A. and he'd seen the Lakers and he saw what it could become. Uh, He wanted to name the team the Seattle Olympians. And he wanted the uniforms to be blue and gold and get Olympia beer to sponsor the team. And, and somehow that got voted down. But I mean, in the Olympians, instead of the Super Sox, you guys could have been running up and down the floor with beer mugs on your chest. It would have been, it would have been so, I mean, he, the, the league needed guys like him and he was not alone. There were others like him that were willing to, you know, for lack of a better phrase, sell, sell the tickets, pop the popcorn, pour the beers, and then sit down there and, you know, I've, I've heard from people, and I think this is true, Rod, to be a successful executive or a successful owner, you've, you've got to have the passion in your heart for the product. You can't just be a business person. And Dick had that. Dick, uh, he, Dick had it, as they say, in spades. He, uh, he was constantly on, constantly up. And as I said, the glass was 20. Uh, it wasn't half full. It was way above mm-hmm. half full with him. Three of the guys you played with are incredibly interesting stories to me, and I, I know a little bit about them, but I'm curious to hear from you. And I think fans, when they think back to 67, will remember these names. There's a guy named Plummer Lot. And he came from Seattle University, he had a decent NBA career, and then went on to be a judge in New York State. He's had an incredible life and an incredible run. Tell me a little bit about Plummer Lot as a player and as a person. Well, uh, uh, Plummer uh, was a terrific athlete to start out with. Great uh, NBA body, uh, uh, terrific, uh, you know, with that running and jump with uh, with most in the league. Uh, the second game we played uh, of the year, we lost our our first game with uh, the uh, we we played the other expansion team, lost at home, went down to their place, and and Plummer played. Uh, a critical role in us winning that game. Uh, he, he was, uh, he was a good player, uh, you know, doing his career, not a great player, but a good player, but a very bright guy, uh, you know, was constantly reading, was constantly, you know, doing things that, uh, you know, that smart people do. And, <laughs> and as you said, went on to become a judge and then just, you know, had a terrific, had a terrific life. Speaking of guys who were smart and well-read and interesting and curious, Tom Mascheri probably could have been anything besides a basketball player. Turns out he plays, he's decent, but this is a guy who went on and he was a teacher. He's been a poet. He's published books. He's a historian. Uh, That wasn't all that common. It never has been in professional sports. He had to stand out a little bit to you. Wonderful human being. Uh, Could speak five languages. Wow. uh, was a tough, tough player, uh, you know, on the court, a good player. Uh, 
the 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 couple of things I remember about Tommy. Now, the first thing again had to do with the fight. Tommy was under the basket. We were playing against uh, uh, the Warriors with uh, Chamberlain, and and Tommy had played with Chamberlain. Had been on Chamberlain's team. They were great friends. And Tommy went up for a shot. Wilt blocked it. Tommy went up for another shot. Wilt blocked it. Tommy went up for the third shot. Wilt blocked it. And Tom took a swing at it. And he, thankfully, he did not hit him uh, because Chamberlain just put his hand on Tom's head. And Tommy was swinging from the floor and, and never hit him. And Wilt was saying, Tom, Tom, don't do it, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and after the game, uh, but Sherry, you know, we were saying, what are you doing? And he said, I lost my mind. He said, you know how big and strong Wilt is. He would have killed me. <laughs> it, it, it's, and we're going to get to your, your, your run as, as uh, director of operations with the NBA. And you had to meet out the fines and suspend guys. I, I it's funny. I think everybody who follows the sport and the people who play the sport, they think their generation was the first to invent fighting in pro basketball. And it goes way back. And it's always been a thing. One of the things I saw you say was that back in that day, the fights were a little more prevalent. The officials would let you fight and rarely did anybody get fined or suspended. Right. Do I have all that right? <laughs> well, a, a big fine in those days was $25. Yeah. You know, that was a big fine. And uh, there were there were a lot of altercations, uh, you know, uh, much more than you obviously see today. The fines are even for the, the money these guys make today. The fines are too much you know, <laughs> for you to go out and, and, and look for, you know, all, uh, fights. Uh, I can remember with again with Machery, we're playing in Philadelphia and he and Chet Walker got kicked out of the game and the next thing you know they're back in the back fighting running <laughs> at each other uh but uh, but 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 tom was a unique guy you know with his poetry with the kind of human being he was and and with what he brought to the table he was he was fantastic but don't ask you about bob weiss i knew bob very well he was an assistant here under george while i was a broadcaster um he was a head coach He's a little bit like you. He devoted his entire life to the game of pro basketball, and he was with you on that first Sonics team. What do you remember about Bob? Uh, very, very smart player. Uh, you know, was a good player. Uh, could make open shots. Uh, had a had a real had a very nice career as a player, and has has gone on. Uh, uh, you know, he, there are a few people that have been around as long as uh, as Bob has, uh, you know, in the league. He's still in the right. league and uh, just had a great career. But another great guy, uh, good guy to be around, very, very knowledgeable about basketball and uh, uh, has done an excellent job. You, uh, near the end of your Seattle career, well, actually after your playing career, you, you, you become Lenny's assistant, you move into coaching. And then I saw some note and I don't understand what this was. I don't know if it was when you were a player or a coach that you also got a degree from the university of Washington at this time, but it take me through that. What, what, what were you doing? Well, at, at the end of, uh, my playing career, uh, I was, oh, uh, I had, uh, transferred a bunch of, a bunch of credits to the university of Washington but I still needed uh, two semesters or three semesters really uh, in order to graduate. And, uh, you know, it's something that I definitely was, you know, wanted to do. I was uh, thinking at the time about going to law school, uh, hmm. uh, you know, when I finished. And so I went to the university and, uh, and graduated, uh, you know, took a bunch of hours for three semesters and ended up graduating that next year. Well, I'm, I'm calling West Virginia, and I'm going to tell them on behalf of the University of Washington, we're taking Thorne. No, no, this idea. You, you dub grad, not, not UWV, UW is, is we're going to claim you. Um, did, did, did you like coaching as you as you moved into it? It's, a, it's It can be a tough transition from player to coach. Did you like it right away? You know, I was, I was fortunate that we had, you know, and Lenny was a great guy to work with and for, uh, you know, Lenny Wilkins is one of the nicest, mm. most uh, competent people that the this league has ever seen. 
Uh, I mean, he's done it all. He's a Hall of Famer as a coach and a player. Uh, and if if they if they if they gave one for a contributor, he'd be that too. So it was great, always great working with him. Tremendous respect for him. And uh, uh, so that that was, I, I you know enjoyed uh, you know that that part of it. Uh, uh, I then went on to uh, to become an assistant coach with the New York Nets in the ABA, and we had Julia serving. Uh, with whom I was not real familiar at the time, but quickly became a big fan of his. And we won the championship my first year there. Uh, Kevin Lockery was our head coach, but Julia Serving was an incredible player also. There's another, this might have been in Loose Balls, Trey Pluto's book about the ABA. There's a quote from you where he said, you, 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 you're going to join Kevin Lockery's staff. And and, and the ABA and even the NBA in those days was like the wild, wild west. There wasn't a lot of video. You didn't see a whole lot. And everybody's telling you about Julius Irving. And I think you said, man, I, I didn't believe 90% of what I heard. So I'm like, this guy can't be that good. And in fact, he could, couldn't he? He was, at, at the time he played for the Nets, he was our leading scorer, our leading rebounder, our leading assist man, our leading st- Dealer of the ball, our leading shot blocker. He guarded the best forward every night. We had Larry Keenan, who was also a terrific player, but uh, at that time he was not a you know a terrific defensive player. So Julius guarded the best forward every night, and the ABA had a lot of good forwards. Mm. Uh, he was unbelievable. Uh, I've seen him a hundred times go to the sideline and cat and reach out and grab a ball with one hand. Like you and I would grab a softball. Right. He'd grab a basketball like that. It was like, wait a minute. Did he just do that again? One night in San Antonio, he's got a breakaway and he got undercut by James Silas, who was the terrific ABA player. And he was about six feet off the floor and if it, again, had been you or I, Mike, we would have fallen on our neck, probably had some serious injury. The guy landed on his feet. You know, when you drop a cat, no matter how you drop it, it always lands on its feet. Hey. The guy landed on his feet. He, he was an incredible athlete, and he could do – he did something every night that, that I would look at Kevin or Kevin would look at me and say, can you believe he just did that <laughs> virtually every night? He, he, he would do something. One of the great characters in the sport at that time was an official named Earl Strom. Everybody remembers <laughs> Earl's name. He came on my show years ago and told me that I asked him if the story was true. And he said it was that. Uh, and back in those days, the, the officials, the players, the coaches, you'd go out drinking after the game. You'd have some beers. Everybody kind of mingle together because you were kind of a traveling carnival type of show. And Earl Strom's out with a couple of reporters after the first game he's officiated with Irving. And he says, I'm telling you, he's that's the greatest player I've ever seen. And the ABA fines him $50. They said, we can't have a referee saying a player's great. The, the fans will think you're cheating for him. So Earl Strom sent the ABA a check for 100 bucks and said, here's 50 bucks for my fine, and here's 50 more for you, because I'm telling you, he's the greatest player I've ever seen. <laughs> well, Earl, uh, I know uh, because I was the head of officials for you know several years, I, I got to know Earl very well he was one of the great characters and great referees you know in the history of uh, professional basketball and the stories about him are legend uh he would he but as a referee he was great because he knew how to deal with players right and he knew how to you know if he saw something getting a little bit out of hand he knew how to take care of it players loved him and uh he was, uh, uh, you know, obviously one of the best ever. Your coaching career uh, comes to an end and you move into an executive position uh, uh, and you held various executive jobs with a, a few different franchises. But I think the one people uh, would remember the most and think about and talk about the most is you're with the Bulls in uh, the early 80s. And here's the, I think it's the 84 draft and everybody's talking about Michael Jordan. Now there are other guys, I mean, Sam Bowie, legendary. If people always talk about, Oh, God, the Blazers took Sam Bowie, Akeem Olajuwon's in that draft. I mean, there's a ton of talent. 
in that draft. What's yeah. it like to be you as it's coming up and how many people are calling you to see if they can get the pick away from the bulls to get in a position to take one of these guys? Well, you know, Mike, uh, Akeem Olajuwon was the, you know, the number one player in that draft at that time. Mm-hmm. And so anybody, including me, had I had the first pick in the draft, I would have taken Akeem. We were not interested in Bowie because our doctors said, don't touch this guy. Oh, wow. You know, our Chicago doctors said, you know, this guy's going to have problems. So Jordan was the guy that, uh, uh, you know, that we were interested in. So I had a conversation with, uh, uh, with the GM of the Blazers about a month before the draft, Stu Inman. And I, he and I were, you know, reasonably good friends. And I, I said, uh, have you guys decided who you're going to take? And he said, if Bowie passes our physical, we're going to take Bowie. You know, we have Drexler, we have Jimmy Paxson, who is a terrific nice. player, a wing player. And, you know, so we're going to, we, we need a big. And about three days before the draft, I called him back and I said, did Bowie pass the physical? And he said, yes, he passed their physical. So I knew going in that we were going to get Jordan. And, uh, you know, I had become, good friends with Dean Smith, uh, who was obviously the Carolina coach. And at the end of every year, I would go to Carolina and he would, he would let me sit and watch all of the, any of the uh, ACC games that I wanted to watch any of the Carolina games or other ACC games uh, that they played. And then we would, he would, uh, talk to me and tell me what he thought about the various players in the ACC or players they played against. And but the one thing, you know, Dean was, you know, the players didn't stand out that much at North Carolina. Right. I mean, they, they, they played a team game and, and, you know, everybody contributed and he, he, but he did say to me, he said, Jordan, I would never say it publicly because I, you know, I just would, do it but Jordan is the most talented player I've had hmm. as far as talent goes I'm not going to say he's the best but he's the most talented player I've had so they've had they had some pretty good players there <laughs> over the course of time so when we got Jordan did did I think when we got him that he turned out to be what he turned out to be no way no way you know my feeling was He's going to be a very good player, and hopefully he'll be an all-star type player one day. And we had him for about a week, and one of our coaches uh, called me, and he said, well, congratulations. And I said, for what? He said, you did not screw this draft up. (laughs) And I said, really? He said, this guy is really good. Hmm. And he was. So you get shuffled out the next year in Chicago. Do you, do you ever, I mean, things worked out great for you You ended up in the league and really impactful with the league, but did you ever feel yourself going, God, I kind of wish we could have made it work. That might not have been a bad place to be for 10 years. Well, you know, I I think naturally you, you have some of those feelings from time to time when you saw Mm -hmm. how it turned out, you know, with, uh, you know, with Michael, but, uh, uh, you know, from my perspective, the, the team changed hands. You know, there was new ownership right. that came in. Uh, the team had not been as successful as certainly I would have liked. And I'm, I'm sure the, uh, you know, the people there would have liked. And so, uh, you know, they, they made a change and uh, I was one of the, ch- or made some changes and I was one of them. Uh, I've always looked at that, Mike, as uh you know, if it, 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 things aren't going to go swimmingly always, and if they don't, try to understand why they didn't work out and go on to whatever's the next thing. And been very fortunate that way. Well, and you end up, and 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 take me through how you end up in the NBA offices because you then end up being there during what I think is maybe the most important fifteen year or so stretch. 
in the league's history. Uh, uh, Jordan becomes a superstar. Magic and Bird are at the end of their thing. A bunch of teams out West get really, really good. Uh, The Bulls have their dynasty. The league grows beyond anyone's imagination. Look, Take me to the start. How how do you end up getting to that NBA job after the Bulls thing uh, changes? You know, um, I uh, traded options on the Chicago Board of Options Exchange for about 10 months. Hmm. And I got a call one day from uh, Russ Granick in the league office asking me if I would be interested in interviewing for uh, the job I ended up taking. And talked it over with my uh, wife and we had lived in New York obviously before when I was with the Nets in the ABA and liked it. And uh, so I interviewed, uh, then I went back and interviewed again and got offered a job and took it. And it was one of the better decisions I think that, uh, that I've made in, you know, in my career and that my kids were growing up at that time as you point out so succinctly, the NBA was on a really big roll, uh, you know, starting the state. They had already started, but it really took off. And, uh, you know, I can still remember those great finals between the Lakers and the Celtics, when, you know, when Magic and Bird and Kareem and Mikhail and all those guys were playing, how great those games were. And then, you know, with the Bulls and Detroit to finally get through Detroit and how tough those games were. And then, you know, the Bulls playing Seattle and Portland in the finals and Utah twice. It was just a great, great time for the NBA. The NBA went from, a, you know, a, a respected good league to a super league during during that time. And it was just great to be part of it. And I, I said earlier that uh, I always thought this was funny. I don't know if you did, but uh, Peter Vesey hung the vice president of violence <laughs> nickname on you because oh, Rod Thorne oh, was man. in charge. Whenever there's a fight, Rod Thorne is going to go through. And there was video by then, yeah. so you could see what's going on. And you had to decide, okay, who's the instigator? Who's getting two games or three games or no games? Who's getting fined? Uh, what? Take me through just an incident, not a specific one, but what would happen? You'd get you'd get into work, and they go, "Hey, there was a fight last night in Phoenix. You got to take a look at it." How'd that go? It no, you got to call it home. That that's the no. first thing. And we had, you know, our uh, imprimatur was that. If there was someone who had to be suspended, he would always be suspended before the next game. Right. So if you had fights on the West Coast, let's say you had a fight on a Friday and somebody's playing on Saturday, you've got to, I can't tell you the calls I I would get at one or two o'clock in the morning from referees telling me what, you know, from their perspective, what had happened uh, in some fight in Seattle, in Portland. And uh, (laughs) so then you you get uh, uh, tape uh, of it uh, from wherever you can get it to start out with. You know, you just you didn't have access to everything back in when I first started. So if you could get it from a TV station, whoever you could get it from, you got Mm. it and you looked at it. You interviewed the participants and then you, you know, ended up doing what you did. But uh, the one that the toughest one ever was there was an altercation between New York and Miami. And when New York was up three, two, and there was a fight that started 20 seconds before the end of the game, game was over. New York had won the game, game was over in Miami. And guys from the Knicks came on the, out on the floor and we ended up suspending, oh, I want to say seven or eight guys. And you did it by alphabetical order. <laughs> and so the next game, the Knicks had Patrick Ewing out, Larry Johnson out, and Miami beat them, you know, up, up in New York. And then in the seventh game, New York had the, the latter part of their roster. <laughs> Couldn't <laughs> play. <Jeez. laughs> and, and Miami beat them again. Oh, my goodness. We got 
300 and some letters and 298 of them were negative. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody were was happy. Negative. Oh boy, that was a tough time. And then living in New York, wow. Well, and, and most of these, as you look back on them, there is, I don't know if it's an element of humor, but you can look at it and go, okay, it was confined to the floor and it, that just happens. Right. Guys are competitive, they're hyped up. You, I, I don't think we're uh, we're in this job anymore. When the malice at the palace happened, they did oh, no. an entire documentary about that. Yeah, are, are, I mean, I'm I'm so thankful that that's a one time deal to this point. Are you surprised that hasn't happened somewhere else? Whether it's in the NBA you know, or the, you know something else? You know, Mike. It's it, the we made a conscious effort to. You're never going to totally do away with fighting uh, right. I mean, because you know the the uh, instincts that come in and then the emotion that comes in but we made a conscious effort that we're going to get it as close to zero as we possibly can and by suspending fining uh over the course of you know of of, of time it uh, i think it, it definitely worked Mm -hmm. And now, you, you know, you still see, you know, we've had a couple of altercations in the last week, you know, where, where players have been suspended. Right. And um, you, you're still going to get some, but it, it's, you've got all these great athletes. You don't need, you know, it's like, it, it, Mike, it's like when our, our game got too physical, if you will, in that the the holding the grabbing the chucking cutters the you know knocking guys out if they were driving yeah. uh it, it got it, it went too far that way so uh, again co uh, consciously we decided hey we, you know we, we don't want our great athletes to you you, you want these people these people to be able to show what they can do and not have somebody trying to take them out so we put up, you know, flagrant foul rules. And I think now, you know, some would say that we've gone too far the other way. That is, it may not be as physical as, as it should be. Uh, but to me, you know, the game we have today, uh, some, and again, some would say there are too many three-point shots. But this game today is great game. And you get in, in the, the smaller players are back in the game. Now they can play. Uh, you know, if you can shoot, you can play uh, now. And uh, before it was almost impossible for them to play because they, you know, they, they couldn't move. So, you know, you do what you feel you have to do in order to keep the game moving in the right direction. I'm, I'm in the middle of a little, I'd like a little more happy medium, a little more, but I, but I get your point. I mean, I don't necessarily want to go back to the days of an NBA finals game, having a final score of 74 to 69, <laughs> you know, it, it's fun to watch a little offense out there. You know, there's a belief out here and we, we you, know, you, you read the signs a little bit. It feels like the NBA wants to come back and the timing's got to be right. The owners have to agree to divide the pot. Uh, they've got to make sure they get as much for an expansion team as they need to. It's going to be more than the 30 bucks you were paying rent to get a, to get a <laughs> franchise back here when you, your rookie year. Uh, do, do you, do, I'm sure you read this stuff. And again, you have a vested interest having some time out here. Do you, are you optimistic about that path existing about, about the NBA getting back to this city? You know something, Mike, I think it'll definitely happen. I, you know, as to when expansion will occur, I certainly am not prescient enough to know that, but, uh, I think in a timely fashion that there will be an expansion. And I think, I think Seattle will be at the head of the list. Well, I hope you're right. Call. I'm sure, you know, Adam Silver, call him and tell him that say, Hey, I just told the Sonics guys you're coming back. So get on it. All right. We're going to wrap it up with uh, something we're calling five quick questions. I don't know. This may be like asking who your favorite kid is, but, but give it a little bit of thought and see of you five quick questions here. Your favorite all-time teammate? Who's your Who's Rod Thorne's favorite teammate? My favorite, uh, Lenny Wilkins. Lenny Wilkins, good answer. Favorite guy to coach, not Marvin Barnes. <laughs> M. L. Carr. M. L. Carr on that same team. He's a, loved he, M. L. Carr. M. L. Carr. Favorite guy you dealt with as, a, as an executive? I mean, you could say Jordan. I guess you drafted, but but somebody in your executive career, you were with other teams too that you like dealing with. Um. 
Whew, that that's uh, that, that I had a pretty good relationship with most everyone. Uh, I enjoy, I enjoyed uh, uh, Bob Ferry, who was Bob in Ferry. Washington. I always enjoyed him. He was, you know, he if you want to make a deal with Bob, you, Bob, here's what I'll give you. Okay, he'd say yes or no. <laughs> Not, <laughs> <That's it. laughs> How about uh, you talked about when you were when you were the uh, the discipline guy, you had to talk to the people that were involved. So I'm going to assume some players were funny about it. Some players were angry. Who was the guy you enjoyed talking to about? Hey, tell me about this fight. Who who was funny to talk to in the discipline days? Oh man, who Anthony Mason was tough. <laughs> to talk to. Uh, Bill Lane Beer, yeah, <laughs> was tough to talk to. Well, you had to have him on speed dial. Oh man. Uh, probably, probably the funniest guy to talk to was Charles Barkley. Yeah, I, I know, figured from that. Time to time, he would uh, cross cross my desk, and he was always <laughs> hilarious. Uh, finally, your favorite uh, boy. This goes back a ways. Whether it was a contemporary that you played with, or somebody you coached, or were an executive, or just watched. Who's your Who's your favorite player of all time? Not the greatest NBA player ever. Just your favorite guy. A guy you'd sit down and watch if he was on NBA TV right now. Uh, Julia serving yeah. uh, because of all of the great, great players that I've been around. He was the best teammate. Hmm. You know, he always thought about uh, the other players on the team. He was always doing things to, you know, to help them. Uh, he was, uh, he was uh, a special, special teammate. True story about Dr. J uh, and my, you know, my wife, we've been married for 30 years and she's, she's not starstruck by guys. It's just not her stuff. We were at a, a, a party during the 96 finals. We're at a party and, and I look up and I can't say, where is she? And I talk to her, have you seen Renee? And they go, she got in a cab. She's going downtown to the Four Seasons because she heard Julius Irving's holding court at the Four Seasons. So she went down to meet him. So that's how, that's how big the doctor was. And even she was like, no, no, I got to go say hi to him. He's a big he deal. Was, he was, he, he was unbelievable. He, uh, well, I'm going to give you one quick story here before we sure. quit about Dr. J. Uh, Larry Keenan uh, was, he would probably average 17, 18 points a game for us. And he loved to score. And he had a couple of games where he was under 10 and he was sort of morose. And as Kevin gave his pregame talk and the players are going out, we're playing Indiana and Julius and George McGinnis are one, two in scoring. I forget who was ahead, but both of them are averaging 29 plus so uh doc sort of stayed back and he said to kevin don't worry about keenan i'll take care of him tonight so in the first quarter every time julius got the ball he drove and he found keenan hmm. and keenan had 12 points in the first quarter and keenan goes on to score 20 some points in the game all smiles and julius scores like 18 in the game, and McGinnis says his normal 30, 29, 30. So we win the game, game's over, and we come back in, and Julius just winked at Kevin. <laughs> I told you, but, you know, I told you I'd take care of him, and I did. You said a great teammate, and the guys that we got to get this guy. <laughs> Meanwhile, 13 year old me's an Indiana fan going, What the heck? How come we can't stop Larry Keenan? Where, where did this guy come from? <laughs> Uh, Roddy, it's a good. delight. It's a delight to talk to you. I knew this would be fun. I had no idea it'd be this much fun and we could go for hours. Uh, congratulations on the hall of fame. I mean, if it, oh, it, thank it, you. It, it's, it's uh, about four years ago, I guess now. And, and well-earned given all the stuff you have done in basketball, are you still active in any way? Do you consult anybody? You know, you I am. I, I, I've, uh, I, I do some consulting for the Washington wizards. Hmm. All right. All and, right. So you, uh, you, you're just not going to stop. Are you? <laughs> oh, I enjoy it. It's it's great. I, I I did some. I worked for Milwaukee for three years, and uh, you know got to got to watch Giannis, you know, He's come something. up and become you know become a great great player. And uh, so it's uh, been very very fortunate, Mike, uh, to still be around it, you know, to some degree, and uh, 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 just uh, just you know, enjoy the games, enjoy uh, the NBA. 
Marcus Johnson was on with us, uh, uh, who's now a broadcaster with Milwaukee, and told us about leaving a game one night. And, and he says that the traffic's kind of held up because some guy's running through the cars. He's like, who is that fool running through the car? And he looks and it's Giannis. He's jogging from the arena over to the practice facility to do some post-game <laughs> workouts because he wasn't happy with his game. <laughs> the, the, the great ones always want to get better, don't they? You know, it's uh, they do. And, and, and where, you know, in Seattle, so many great, great players are coming out of Seattle now. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. We get a team back here, though. It'd be even more. That's hopefully uh, what's going to happen next. Rod, it's great to talk to you. Thanks for reminiscing with us. And congratulations on a great career that is ongoing. Uh, and maybe we'll do this again sometime. I appreciate the time. Hey, thank you, Mike. Enjoy it. Rod Thorne, legendary NBA figure and member of the uh, NBA, or actually the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame, our guest on Iconic Sonics.